As we are uh, finding our way to our final seating arrangement here this morning, just a, a word of welcome, and I'll give an extended welcome later, but uh, I'm Bishop Tom Aiken from the Northeastern Minnesota Synod of the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Good to see some folks that I know, many who are strangers to me. Your presence here today is gold. It is so important, I wonder if you know how important it is that you are here. Some people never experience um, an ordination in their lifetime. These are so important for the life of the church, and especially for this marvelous person we are ordaining today. At this time, I would like to call on Alberta Shaw to read a poem. Gershon, the woman who crafted this beautiful poem, couldn't be here today for health reasons. So I shall read it. I awoke. I awoke, thinking I heard a voice in my room. I dragged my eyes open. No one tried to go back to sleep. I was on the edge. That voice again, louder. My eyes sprung open, still no one. Then I realized the voice was inside me. The next thing, I was hugging the wall between my desk and my dresser, clutching my childhood quilt in front of me. I was alone then. Abruptly, I wasn't. A woman had suddenly appeared on the other side of my room, but I wasn't frightened. I actually relaxed until she began to speak. Hers was the voice I've been hearing. Megan, do not be afraid. I am an angel serving as an emissary of the mother of the one who was promised. Just as you made a promise to minister to God's people on your earth with no regard to availability of money, place of origin, bedmate, couple or not, Mary is most pleased with your heart dedication, and desire to minister to the people of Emmanuel. She is also quite proud to affirm for you that quite soon all your years of learning and training and working in jobs that were not quite right are to be rewarded. In a very short time, a church will find you and call you, but heed this warning. You will find far more pitfalls than recognition in this work you have chosen. But for now, I anoint you with the blessings of Mary. <laughs> Be at peace. Thank you so much for that poem. Again, a word of welcome to all of you. And just a, a short uh, understanding of ordination itself. Today we are reaching back into the ancient church. We're going way back and following protocol in one form or another that has been used for centuries. And not only will this marvelous candidate for ordination soon be ordained with all her many gifts, make some promises and take some vows, but you also are going to make promises. You're going to make some vows. I'll have you stand up during that part do it with confidence and with grace and with integrity. This is a beautiful day. Please turn to your opening hymn, All Our Love. Please stand.
us, the one who heals us, the one who reforms us again and again. Amen. Let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, serve us, reform us to be a church powered by love, willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cry and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower our lives in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional, and we are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Christ, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
signs and beginnings, as Samuel heard your call, and Mary recognized your voice as you called her in the garden. Touch our hearts to hear your call today. Grant that Megan, now to be ordained, may carry out this ministry faithfully in the power of your spirit through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Jeremiah, the 29th chapter. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come to pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you back from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Word of God, word of life.
A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans, the 12th chapter. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Word of God, word of life. for you to find a home with all of your gifts 
and all of your talents to serve the body of Christ, it's a shame. And on behalf of the EOCA, I apologize to you for all that you have gone through. Somebody say amen. 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 <laughs> so there Mary is in the garden. She sees Jesus, but she doesn't know it was Jesus. And I like to put forth this argument that that proves that Jesus was brown. Because <laughs> when she saw him, she said, oh, he's the help. <laughs> when you can't say amen, you just say ouch. So Mary does not recognize Jesus until he speaks her name. Oh, I just love that. When she hears his name, she knows this is the Messiah. Megan, Jesus has called you by name. Theologian Parker Palmer calls the space that Mary occupies in this story the tragic gap. In the tragic gap, we stand between what is what we know to be true of the world, and what can be, what we imagine the world could be. In this space, our hearts are broken, and Palmer writes that our hearts can be broken in a couple of different ways. He writes this, Who among us has not suffered a loss so heartbreaking that we wondered how we could go on living? Who among us has not been tempted to shut down in the wake of such a loss, to turn toward bitterness, cynicism, and anger, perhaps even going there for a while. The heart can be broken into a thousand shards, sharp-edged fragments that sometimes become shrapnel aimed at the source of our pain. But there is another way to visualize what a broken heart might mean. Imagine that small clenched fist of a heart broken open into largeness of life, into greater capacity to hold one's own and the world's pain and joy. This too happens every day. We know that heartbreak can become a source of compassion and grace because we have seen it happen with our own eyes as people enlarge their capacity for empathy and their ability to attend to the suffering of others. While this congregation was awaiting to receive a new permanent pastor, we hired Megan to work alongside of us as a soon-to-be ordained in our own pastors of sorts. In her ministry, I witnessed a heart broken open a heart willing to engage her own loss, a heart ready to hold the world's pain and joy. I saw a capacious heart in her eagerness to listen to homebound members, in her attentiveness to the language of inclusion and worship, and in her willingness to march with the neighbor in their distress. It's not surprising to me that Megan chose the story of Mary weeping beside the tomb for her ordination service. It's a story that reminds us that while fear and cynicism are awfully seductive, Christ shows us another way. Living between what we know the world to be and what we know the world can be, faith invites us to believe that nothing is beyond redemption. No loss we experience, no person we encounter, and no system is beyond the transformative work of God. Mary's heartbreak at the grave becomes an opening for new life. So too it is with us. Mary at the tomb shows us that it, even in the midst of death and tragedy, Jesus is ever present. And so now Megan's role becomes one that points others toward this life to remind them that death will never, ever have the last word. Because indeed, we are resurrection people. Yes. <laughs>
part of our spiritual DNA. We are resurrection people. And so Megan will be called to stay very near the tomb because that is where you will be most needed. To stay very near the tomb and position yourself there so that you're close to those who are hurting, close to those who are in exile, close to those who have been minoritized and marginalized and oppressed by the systems that we live in with and under. And there, in and near the tomb, you will be part of the pain. Then you can walk in compassion, right? Suffering with others. But it also gives you a front row seat to the resurrection promise. Stones will be rolled away and you will be part of that miracle. Death will not have the last word, and you will be part of those miracles. You will be a conduit of God's power and grace. Just as Mary was positioned near the tomb, Megan's call is 20 minutes from Ferguson. So the road that opens up before you is one where you will march and walk in strength and power. And we may be short in stature, oh, but I know that there is a giant that lives inside of you and she will walk. Oh, I feel like preaching today. She will walk in power and strength. And to that, we are witnesses and we are so proud. You know, my um, preaching professor said that when I uh, preach at an ordination, Jesus is the star of the show. And so you cannot make the person that's being ordained the star of the show. So see, we're not going to stand up here and tell you all how awesome this woman is. Because she's not the star of the show, Jesus is the star of the show. So what I'm going to tell you that this congregation that you're going to is blessed to have you. <laughs> we're not going to say anything like that. <laughs> We know that you've been strengthened by the saints. Mary Magdalene, patron saint of women, strengthens us for the journey. You have been called by name, Megan. And like Mary, you are positioned to proclaim to others, I have seen the Lord. We wonder what kind of a reception Mary received when she went running to the disciples with this good news. Was it delight, doubt, disbelief? A few weeks ago, Megan got a call right after Sunday morning worship from the congregation that, is, that she's going to. The caller said that the vote on her call had been overwhelmingly positive. Megan came up to me with this stunned look on her face and said something like, it's really happening. <laughs> we immediately turned toward this room full of congregants, stood up on a chair, and announced that the waiting had come to, to an end, that this beloved member of this community was on her way into a new vocation. The room cheered. Yes. <laughs> that for a minute or two, the fullness of life was shared among many. Sure, the news was unique and particularly powerful for Megan, but the thing about abundant life is that it always can be shared. Mary runs to her people, and we run to ours because good news of life abundant cannot be contained. These actions serve as gentle reminders that abundant life is not a pie. It's not a limited resource. It need not be rationed. Life for one does not mean less life for another. It can be shared because there is more than enough for all. And in a world that often chooses 
to operate on a scarcity model. The good news of abundant life offers us a whole new paradigm. It has the power to move us from standing guard at the tomb to using every last bit of what we've got to roll the stones away. It has the power to pick up the shards of our broken hearts and hold them together with the pain and joy of the world. It ha has the power to draw us from comfort and safety and nearer to the neighbor. Yes, it has the power to cause us to run to our communities, stand up on chairs, and announce that we have caught a glimpse of the world as we know it can be. Big-hearted, abundant, alive, and free. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
whole globe, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Death, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may all be seated. And I would ask at this time that Megan, Catherine, and Lachlan please come forward. We present for ordination to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament. Megan Catherine McLaughlin, who has been prepared, examined, and approved for this ministry, and who has been called by the Church to this ministry through the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Thanks be to God. All baptized Christians are called to share in Christ's ministry of love and service in the world, to the glory of God, for the sake of the human family, and the whole creation. According to apostolic usage, Megan, you are now to be entrusted with the office of word and sacrament in the one holy Catholic Church by the laying on of hands and by prayer. A reading from John. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. A reading from Matthew. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that at the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he took it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This covenant, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Megan Catherine McLaughlin, before Almighty God, to whom you must give account, and in the presence of this assembly, I ask, will you assume this office, believing that the church's call is God's call to ministry of word and sacrament? If so answer, I will, and I ask God to. I will, and I ask God to help me. The church in which you are to be ordained confesses that the Holy Scriptures are the word of God, and are the norm of its faith and life. We accept, teach, and confess the Apostles, the Nicene, and the Athanasian creeds. We also acknowledge the Lutheran confessions as true witnesses and faithful expositions of the Scriptures. Will you, therefore, preach and teach in accordance with the Scriptures and these creeds and confessions? I will, and I ask God to help Will you be diligent in your study of the scripture and faithful in your use of the means of grace? Will you pray for God's people, nourish them with word and sacraments, 
and lead them by your own example in faithful service and holy living. I will, and I ask God to help me. Will you give faithful witness in the whole world that God's love may be known in all that you do? I will, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and compassion to perform them. Amen.
this time. And stand behind me, pastors and deacons. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, we bless you for your infinite love in Christ our Lord, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. We thank you that by his death your Son overcame death, and that raised by your mighty power, he gives us new life. We praise you that having ascended into heaven, Christ pours out his gifts abundantly on the church, making some apostles, some prophets, some pastors and teachers to equip your people for the work of ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. This is the ancient rite of laying on of hands from scripture. some fashion here with our hands. Eternal God, through your Son Jesus Christ, pour out your Holy Spirit upon Megan and fill her with the gifts of grace for the ministry of word and sacrament. Bless her proclamation of your word and administration of your sacraments so that your church may be gathered for praise and strengthened for service. Make her a faithful pastor a patient teacher and wise counselor. Grant that in all things she may serve without reproach, that your people may be renewed and your name be glorified in the church through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let the clergy be seated. And as many of you know, the stole, this is the part of the ordination right where the stole is placed on Megan. The stole is a biblical symbol of being yoked to Christ and having good work to do. And as we heard in the sermon, there is much good work to do. Receive this stole as a sign of your as a sign of your work and live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, serving his people and remembering his prom promise in St. Matthew. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Megan, hear the words of the apostles. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you have been called. And again, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians to feed the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own Son. And again, tend the flock of God that is in your charge, not under compulsion, but willingly, not for sordid gain, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. And again, think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. 
May they care for God's people, bear their burdens, and do not betray their confidence. So discipline yourself in life and teaching that you preserve the truth, giving no occasion for false security or illusory hope. Witness faithfully in word and deed to all people. Give and receive comfort as you serve within the church, and be of good courage, for God has called you, and your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do God's will, working in you that which is pleasing in God's sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Assembly, please stand. Megan, will you face the assembly? Pastor Megan, will you face the assembly? <laughs> Will you, assembled as the people of God and speaking for the whole church, receive Megan as a messenger of Jesus Christ, sent by God to serve all people with the gospel of hope and salvation? Will you regard her as a servant of Christ? We will. Will you pray for her, help and honor her for her work's sake? and in all things strive to live together in the peace and unity of Christ. We will be Then let it be acclaimed that Megan McLaughlin is a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ. She has Christ's authority to preach the word and administer the sacraments, serving God's people as together we bear God's creative and redeeming love to all the world. Thanks be to God. Always. And also, also with you. share the peace with each other.